Tokyo has just about everything, everything but space. And architects are answering the challenge with big ideas about living small. How do you provide for community, uh, for comfort? How do you give light and air and greenery to all these people? Explore Tokyo's inventive solutions, from hotel rooms no larger than a phone booth, to illusory tricks of light, to floor plans that turn small into spacious. There's an outside, inside the house. Tokyo, living small in the big city. An architect's pen glides across the blank page. A frail-looking shorthand of an idea emerges. Though it may not look like much, one day this sketch will bloom into a structure that defines space, ushers light into darkness, and solves the puzzle that all Tokyo architects must solve. How to create a sense of spaciousness in a city where little space exists. All the design in Tokyo is very sensitive about creating some visual effect so that the people can feel the whole volume. The essential challenge for every architect in Tokyo is overcoming the space restrictions of an overwhelming adversary, Tokyo itself. The greater Tokyo area sprawls over 3,025 square miles, a megacity that includes Tokyo and most of the three prefectures that surround it. No city on Earth is more populated. 35 million people live here, 13 million more than the population of the New York metropolitan area. Tokyo's dense center, Tokyo City, contains more than 12 million people in just 844 square miles. And in some areas, Tokyo City squeezes more than 50,000 people into one square mile, more than three times the population density of Chicago. Mostly out of necessity, Tokyo residents have embraced the concept of living small. At a time when the average American new home has swollen to 2,400 square feet, and the typical European home encompasses more than 1,000 square feet, Tokyo residents are making do with homes averaging only 678 square feet. But a new wave of Tokyo architects is revolutionizing the art of transforming small spaces into innovative original dwellings. Confined spaces present a very material problem for Japanese architects, which they often resolve using ethereal solutions, like the innovative manipulation of light. Few sites in Tokyo better demonstrate how sunlight can make a small home seem larger than the plump and aptly named Penguin House. It was designed by award-winning architect Yasuhiro Yamashita, whose design philosophy revolves around the notion of allowing the structure's environment to dictate the architectural approach. Located on a corner lot in Tokyo's Itabashi district, Penguin House is small, even by Tokyo standards. The structure's footprint takes up a mere 322 square feet, the size of a two-car garage. The house's floor space covers just 899 square feet. Yamashita used light to make the cramped interior seem more expansive. Here is the passageway. The street is here, and the land is here. There, using a very simple idea, I set up four walls and cut off the corners. Light comes inside through these cut-off corners. And these cut-off corners are all illuminated. And by placing a glass box on top of it, I've realized a space where the light comes in and you can see outside. But deft use of light was just the point of departure for this veteran architect. Yamashita has also made rooms feel bigger 
by extending sight lines. The streamlined design of the staircase affords occupants a view past the stairs to the open space beyond. Also, this kitchen countertop floats above the stairwell, using space that is usually wasted and with no visible support structure, creating a less cluttered appearance. The openness of the space in Penguin House is truly an illusion. None of these rooms is larger than 200 square feet. The entrance hall is narrow, but has a high ceiling, and welcomes people with a sense of open space above them. And here, in this corner, is a small bathroom. The area itself is small, but because the ceiling is high, it does not feel very small. Human beings do not find the area small if the area has a high ceiling, and we use this logic in various ways. Yamashita raised and lowered ceiling heights throughout the house depending on the floor space of the room. The smaller the room, the higher the ceiling. The 21-foot tall foyer sits next to a music studio with a 9-foot high ceiling. On the second floor, the 11-foot tall bathrooms adjoin the lower 8-foot tall bedroom. Light, height, and sight. Nowhere in the house do these attributes make small seem larger than in the top level, bounded by wall-to-wall -wall windows. In this penguin house, we made this room on the third floor into a light box. Light comes in and disperses, and you can see outside, which gives you this sense of space. And in that sense, this glass box provides you with a feeling of roominess. Five miles away from Penguin House, another residence, the house at Naka Ikegami, showcases how Tokyo's architects are conserving space through inventive storage. It was designed for a small family by Tomoyuki Utsumi. The house's footprint is only 475 square feet. And if the house inadvertently conjures the image of a storage shed, in some ways, that's appropriate. Utsumi's elegant approach to storage, most of it hidden from view, like these wall cabinets, is the house's dominant innovation. On each floor, the architect has placed storage areas beneath counters, beneath stairs, and underfoot. This allows the occupants to reduce clutter and retain the clean lines of the house's original design. As we enter the house, this side of the wall is uh, full of storage. This is, in fact, the main storage of the house, and of course, in a kind of narrow corridor like this, the only way to go is with sliding doors. Author Asby Brown writes extensively about spatial design in Japanese architecture. This is the, the child's room. Uh, if we look underneath the bed, it's just, I think, a, a wonderful example of good, compact, fold-out, convertible design. Uh, here's the desk unit folds out. This is a large drawer on rollers, comes out, lots of room for all kind of things. There's a seat down here. In fact, a couple of seats. If we have some friends over, they can all sit and, and play. And these, of course, are storage units as well. And so we climb up towards the light and find ourselves in a big, bright, well-lit room. Uh, the living space of this house is primarily this floor. The second floor of the house is actually one large room that conveys a sense of spaciousness. But the architect has nonetheless separated the kitchen from the living dining room area with a subtle visual cue. The room itself is divided into two, not by using any kind of wall or any kind of solid barrier, but just by a change in level. And this is a very, very good technique uh, for distinguishing space uh, when you don't have a lot of room. The design of the living dining room enhances openness and togetherness. So whereas many of us would assume that you need a separate space for eating the dining room and a separate space for talking with friends, maybe a living room and a separate space for being with your family, like a family room and you need an office and all these things to be separate, well here we see that one space can be multifunction, can serve all of those purposes admirably and in fact allow even more togetherness for the family than would otherwise be the case. Even the white wall surfaces enhance the sense of openness in the house. The materials, again, are all white. The floor, the walls, the ceiling, everything else. 
that really lets the natural light reflect uh, more easily and uh, it brightens up the whole space. The kitchen of the house is really perhaps the most amazing part of it. A lot of energy went into here, mainly because the clients themselves are really big cooking fans. When you're having a big dinner party, you need a place for your storage bowls, for cups and whatnot for your guests, and they all fit beautifully underneath this cabinet. But the real ta-da moment comes when you give it a little tug. It pulls away from the wall, and now you've doubled your counter space in this part of the kitchen. It's a truism that you can never have enough storage in your house. And in Japanese homes, it's a particular challenge. There's a tradition of having storage under the stairs, etc. And here we can see a wonderful way that Mr. Utsumi updated that notion. We open this, you pull it out, you can see the stair, and he's simply just provided a big open space underneath for all manner of boxes and whatnot to be put. Japanese houses have had storage under the floor for hundreds of years, and here's a little unit right there. It's a, a wonderful place to have a little bit of extra storage. Surprisingly, the house has very few windows, but given the proximity of its neighbors, there wouldn't be much of a view anyway. Instead, the architect has made a wonderful skylight that starts from the lowest corner of the house and climbs all the way up the ridge to above the sleeping loft. So there's an incredible, beautiful gap through which the sunlight spills and it activates the house. But ultimately, it is the openness of the house that gives the owner, Takashi Kamada, the most satisfaction. The first floor is our kids, the second floor is mine, and the third floor is my wife's. We're on different levels, but we're aware that we're here together, and that's wonderful. Not everyone in Tokyo can afford the time or money that a custom-designed home like this one requires. For them, there's another option. Many small homes in Tokyo are prefabricated or built off-site in a factory, like this one at Daiwa House. Companies like Daiwa build about 18% of the new homes in Japan. Such prefab homes cost up to 20% less than conventional homes. Daiwa's smallest models span just 750 square feet and cost about $130,000. We can cut down cost, uh, do it faster, and we can give a better quality because we can control the factory process. After the concrete foundation has been laid at the home site, Daiwa's workers assemble the structure's prefab posts, steel beams, and wall panels. They complete the house's weatherproof shell in as little as one day. Installing the interior components consumes three months or less. Perhaps the most unique aspect about Daiwa is that each of the 69 distinct floor plans it offers displays an idiosyncratic design sensibility, that of its architect, Edward Suzuki. The designer's principal concept is to pull the great outdoors indoors in homes that Daiwa has dubbed Eddie's houses. In other words, there's an outside, inside the house. There's a word uh, called shakkei, which means borrowing the landscape, uh, borrowing the scenery. But unfortunately, these days, especially in urban residential areas, we can't attain this uh, effect of shakkei simply because the surroundings are not visually beautiful to begin with. Suzuki overcame this challenge by carving an atrium measuring almost 100 square feet out of each of the floors of this 1,200 square foot home. Although this reduced the potential floor space by roughly 16%, it created a vaulted space for greenery, in this case, bamboo. In his eyes, it is addition by subtraction. You can create a whole scene within this three by three square meter space. Beyond bringing the outdoors in to liberate his design, Suzuki was careful not to segment the limited floor space by creating too many rooms. He chose instead to open up the floor plan by featuring fewer rooms with multi-purpose functions. I'm trying to make the house look more spacier than it really is. 
by combining living dining kitchen as one room. Sometimes uh, even two floors may be combined as one three-dimensional room. What's really now appreciated and needed is the spaciousness of each room, the voluptuousness of each room, rather than the number of small spaces. In their efforts to expand limited spaces, Tokyo architects are also extending the limits of design. Tokyo's residents live in apartment buildings. Some of the buildings, like these, are called mansions. That's right, it's not some misappropriation of language, but simply salesmanship, a desire to evoke the sprawling space that most Tokyo apartments so notably lack. A mansion apartment in Tokyo averages just 200 square feet three times less than that of a typical apartment in Manhattan. Architects like Manabu Chiba embrace Tokyo's urban density. Rather than walling off spaces, Chiba orchestrates interiors to showcase specific views of the world outside. Case in point, this three-unit apartment building that Chiba himself has lived in since 2006. The architect's space enlarging designs play with the ever shifting line between public and private areas. So, please come in. So, this is the main staircase. In a way, you can see this a little bit of private uh, life of someone else, uh, other unit, because uh, instead of just separating each property or each house or each private residence, I try to always create a kind of good interaction. Chiba plays with the tension between public and private, and between inside and outside throughout the apartment. The outer stairwell is visible from the living room, the bedroom from inside the bathroom, and the city from numerous vantages, including a deck. I love this. I love this landscape. But Chiba's first instincts in his approach to these 645 square foot apartments were not quite so open to the environment. I just first thought that maybe this uh, planning should be very protective. So my first idea was to make a very thick wall. But it's not nice to just to protect the private living condition from environment because that will create a terrible city, you know, just a closed box. So I start to think about how do you open this very thick wall. Chiba created a sense of openness and storage space by transforming the walls into two-foot-deep cabinets. I try to make this all coded space very you know, simple and then uh, the line is very minimal. And so you almost feel like that this is like a wall of uh, this house. The apartment's recessed windows, lined with mirror-like stainless steel, make the living space seem larger by reflecting glimpses of the world outside. If you just look at the window, then you cannot see the sky because the, the high-rise mansion is there, but because of this reflection, you can even see the sky on, uh, at the bottom of the window, or sometimes you can see uh, the streets, people walking on the street. This window has lots of information of the environment. Chiba's concept for the windows influenced other areas of the small apartment's design, adding to its sense of openness. I thought that maybe it's nice to make the material of the floor and in the ceiling a little bit shiny, reflecting as the extension of this material of the stainless. The reflections connect the apartment's interior to the greater world outside. It's just showing the time of the movement of the sun or movement of the climate or the change of the environment. Chiba enhanced the floor plan's open feeling by making it circular. You can enter, pass from room to room, and end up where you started. No dead ends, no cramped sensation. Chiba's 645 square foot apartment is the epitome of high design but it represents the exception.
Most Tokyo apartments strive simply to be functional and comfortable in about half as much space. Such is the dwelling of illustrator Laura Stagno, who moved to Tokyo from Venezuela in 2003. She pays a monthly rent of 86,000 yen, or roughly $1,000, for her apartment in Tokyo's Shimokitazawa neighborhood. Spanning 269 square feet, her apartment is larger and, in relative terms, more luxurious than many. As in all Tokyo dwellings, shoes are left at the door as one enters. Actually, you take your shoes off and you come in and uh, you're barefoot, everything is clean. This simple Japanese precept, no shoes inside the house, helps maximize the apartment space. It frees the floor to serve more functions than it does in the West because it's cleaner. Since it's small, you have to use everything. You use the floor a lot. So you sit on the floor, you eat on the floor. Every room of Laura's apartment shows her attention to style and efficiency. No space is wasted. Furnishings are all portable and flexible. These tables are a set of three, and you can separate them, but you can put them together and make a big one. So if I have a party, for example, and that little table is not enough, so I can make a lot of space. Much of Laura's furniture is stackable or collapsible and was ordered by catalog from stores like Dino's House Stylings, which sells space-saving furniture, like this innovative rotating twin top table. So, for instance, when your friends come to visit and you need more table space, by simply turning this table like this, you can make it one size bigger. Just about everything in the store is designed to collapse, to lean lightly against a wall, to fit neatly together, to reveal or conceal, or to stack in order to fit into small areas like Laura's kitchen, which is extremely functional. In it, she manages to fit a small refrigerator, microwave, and a two-burner stove and grill. In Japan, you can buy all kinds of stuff, very cheap, so everything will fit. You'll find a way to fit it. And here, you can dry stuff, and then when you cook, you have enough space. So it's very compact, but you have everything you need. Laura's bathroom is tiny and functional, and contains a distinctively Japanese water-conserving toilet. This is typical. You flush the toilet and then you have the water here. You wash your hands, so you save water. So that's, yeah, that's very typical type of toilet. Like so many Tokyo residents, Laura takes pleasure in her compact, stylish apartment, proving that the art of living small here has been mastered by more than just the natives. In Tokyo, there is a cheaper alternative to the ubiquitous concrete mansion apartment buildings that dominate the landscape. This low-rise, low-rent wood frame housing is a remnant from World War II, when shelter in the firebombed city had been rebuilt quickly and inexpensively. I'll show you inside, so I'll come inside. Shin Ikeda is a meter reader for the water company. He shares this apartment building with five other tenants. And this is where we put uh, shoes, and, and this is where we put the nails. Okay, so there are two rooms on each side, two on this side and uh, two on this side. And there's one on the back, and I'll show you mine and come inside. Ikeda's room spans roughly 100 square feet. He pays 25,000 yen a month in rent about 300 American dollars. By any first world city standards, that's a bargain, but it comes at a price. Everything Ikeda does, from cooking to working to sleeping, must take place in this tiny room. I sleep on the sofa. I should this like uh, become bed, but uh, I have a two futons in here, just in case when guest comes. And I have a kitchen over here. And I got everything like stove and the sink, and uh, I have a little fridge over there. 
Ikeda's rustic room, like one out of every five apartments in Tokyo, lacks one crucial amenity, a bathroom. He must use one of four communal toilets in the building. I'll show you one of these. Uh, this is what is called a squat toilet, Japanese style toilet. And uh, yeah, you actually squat and do your business. There are no tubs or showers in these rudimentary apartments. So to bathe, Ikeda and millions like him regularly venture outside to one of Tokyo's 1,100 public baths, or sentos. The sento has been a fixture of Japanese life since the 16th century, but its numbers peaked in the years after the Second World War, when thousands of dwellings lacking full bathroom facilities were being built. I go to Sento maybe three or four times a week. And some people go more, but I mean, just because it's getting expensive these days. I actually use sports like wash your body first and then go to the bath. Because otherwise, you know, if you go with your body with a lot of dirt, and you might make a mess of the water. Most of the center has maybe two or three uh, different baths. And uh, each bath has a uh, maybe different temperature. And they even put something inside that makes it smell nice. I take my time. That's my, one of my favorite plays. Yeah, so I took at least like one hour. Inconvenience transformed into a pleasurable ritual. In Tokyo, this kind of compensation is more the rule than the exception. What you can't or don't want to do inside your cramped living space can be accomplished out in the city, often right outside your front door. Tokyo as a city becomes an extension of your own private place. Basically, you meet friends out. You don't meet friends inside your house. The streets themselves are a kind of living room. A lot of functions that would be served or taken care of within the home in most areas of the West are often offloaded in Japan into these other areas of the city. Storage is offloaded into Tokyo's three million vending machines that sell everything from t-shirts to umbrellas to books to lingerie and even pornography. It's really hot during the summer, it's really cold during the winter, and vending machines serve both hot and cold drinks. So, you know, if you're freezing in the winter and you want some, you know, hot corn soup, you can get it out of a can from a vending machine. It's absolutely super efficient. There's one machine for every 11 people in Tokyo, a ratio four times greater than in the United States. The space crunch is also squeezing out some of Tokyo's smallest inhabitants, pets. For those who lack the space at home to keep them, Tokyo has a practical solution. Welcome to the Nekobukuru Cat's House. For 600 yen, or roughly $7, Tokyo's pet-starved residents can rent some quality cat time in this petting zoo. But some cats are more cooperative than others. Chances are you'll get a warmer reception than this somewhere here among the 20 or so felines of various shapes, sizes, and breeds. There's always one willing to play or at the very least, pose for a picture. In this urban jungle that reserves no space for them, these pampered cats are a luxury item, and they're treated as such. In Tokyo, space restrictions have also made luxury items out of cars. It costs as much as $700 per month to park downtown. Nonetheless, some 9 million cars swarm into Tokyo on the average workday, and they all have to park somewhere. City planners have responded with automated parking facilities like this. Automation eliminates the need for ramps and driveways for motorists to park their own vehicles. Instead, this space can be reserved strictly for parking spots, 
maximizing capacity. Once the driver enters, machines do all the rest. In reality, this is where the customer is supposed to get out of the vehicle. After that, the machine will bring this car down to the basement automatically, and the machine is called a lift. And after that, there's a process called daisha, and this is where the car is moved sideways. And as I will show you later, each cell is a parking space. In this process, the machine will automatically place the vehicle into the cell. The four-story lot has space for 650 cars, but it's just one of 12 lots beneath the vast Roppongi Hills complex, a multi-use facility that consists of office space, apartments, museums, shopping, and restaurants that accommodates 150,000 visitors every day. As you know, we have very limited space, and we want to maximize it. So we use this automated parking system, which represents about 70% of all our parking. Once your car is shoehorned into place in the city, you can enjoy the evening. And if you're on the prowl for nightlife, Tokyo's social scene is world-renowned. Since there's so little space to party at home, most mixing occurs anywhere but there. This is Nombei Okocho, a small district of uh, very, very tiny bars in Tokyo's Shibuya area. Every city in Japan has districts like this, little ramshackle establishments that have been serving alcohol to uh, customers since the end of the war. It's interesting that uh, the size of these establishments, really, you can sort of reach from one side of the wall to the other if you stretch out your hands. We're here at the bar Non in Shibuya's Nombei Yokocho, Drunkard's Alley. Uh, if this is a typical bar. Uh, the size is barely enough for four or five people to fit. <laughs> and uh, it encourages a certain type of togetherness. For couples looking to take togetherness to the next level, Tokyo offers a custom-made solution at an affordable price in what are called love hotels. Why not just have sex at home? For many couples, the opportunities are limited. A lack of space leads to a lack of intimacy. Japanese don't really have problems with sex uh, in itself, but they do care a lot about appropriate behavior, about you know being seen or not seen in certain situations by their neighbors or other people. So privacy side is very, very important. To maintain privacy, love hotels go to great lengths. The entry itself has to be very discreet. So there's usually just an archway or a gap where you sort of duck behind a wall, you know, off the street as quickly as possible. As you enter, you see the machine showing the photograph of each image of the rooms. And then you press the button wherever you want to get in. Then you enter a small foyer where you can't even see uh, the proprietor or the manager, whoever's behind the desk. They maintain incredible color, uh, design sense, entertainment value, uh, as well as convenience, comfort, security, privacy. The hotel room itself is usually a little enclosed world. Uh, it's a playroom. The bed, of course, is the center. And the lighting is wonderfully worked out. Dimmers and, and soft lighting, everyone's gonna look wonderful. <laughs> All sorts of amenities can be purchased without leaving the room, including cigarettes, alcohol, condoms, and sex toys. It is not surprising, I suppose, that love hotels are often used by married couples. People who have kids at home, there's no privacy within the home. If they want to have uh, sex, they may need to go outside, uh, you know, and actually uh, find themselves a, a love hotel and spend their time there. I think the concept of the La Hotel represents this notion of shared private space. Everybody's there, probably 50 people is there doing the same thing, but none of them will meet to each other. 
seemingly frivolous, love hotels are in fact methodically designed to meet many couples' needs for intimacy. At night, Tokyo pulsates with a unique energy that's part Las Vegas and part Manhattan. But not all that energy generates from its storied nightlife. The Japanese are renowned for pouring their souls into their work, and Tokyo, overcrowded with go-getters, may be the epicenter of that ethic. Workers average a 55-hour week, and 90-minute commutes to and from work are common. At the end of a long day of overwork or over-socializing, a businessman too tired or too wobbly to make it home has a welcome option. Even in this densely packed city with no room to spare, he can find the tiniest of spaces to rest his weary head. It's aptly called a capsule hotel. It makes sense, actually, if you work late, then you cannot find the train to go back to your home, then taxi will be so expensive, then it's better for him to stay in this capsule hotel. Capsule hotels are inexpensive, less than $30 a night, and many are exclusively for men. There are no rooms, just sleeping pods, measuring only three feet by six feet. Each is molded out of plastic or fiberglass and provides just enough room to recline. They're more like berths on an overnight train where you may have to climb a ladder to get into the one above. Uh, usually they're stacked three high, there's one on the bottom, a middle one, and a top one, uh, and they're entered from the end. And the typical floor of a, of a capsule hotel may have 30 or 40 or 50 of these things on one floor. They usually have a television and a radio and reading lamp. And I've always found them to be certainly adequate. Not kind of place that I want to spend more than one or maybe two nights, but certainly adequate and, in fact, really kind of amusing and pleasurable uh, in its way. This ultimate expression of space-saving pragmatism has very esoteric origins. In 1972, architect Kisho Kurokawa completed the Nakajin capsule tower in Tokyo's Ginza district. Though decades have passed, this unique building still seems to hail from some unrealized future. This is my first uh, capsule uh, buildings. Uh, I did many other capsule buildings uh, in other places. Each of these 140 small living units was prefabricated in a factory, hoisted into place by a crane, and then bolted to a central steel core with four high-tension bolts. In Tokyo, where the average lifespan of a building is just 25 years, Kurokawa designed the structure so that capsules could be removed, replaced, and remounted on the building's steel core. Essentially, architectural recycling. Kurokawa's capsules, just 12 feet by 6 feet, aren't large enough to be primary residences, but were intended merely as studios for short stays. You can have your own studio here, in addition to your house. Or for the company, uh, you can buy three or four uh, you know, units as uh, a small business type of hotel unit. These capsules can also provide commuters a break from the daily grind. Average commuting time is three hours a day is uh, losing uh, important uh, time. Kurokawa's ideal of architectural recycling has yet to take root. And this unique tower, the inspiration for countless capsule hotels, is an oddly compelling structure that remains ahead of its time. City planners are constantly tinkering with the layout of Tokyo's streets and sidewalks. 
creating new slivers of valuable land available for development. The realignment of this intersection resulted in one such sliver and a daunting challenge for transplanted British architects Mark Dytham and Astrid Klein. One of our very good clients here came to us and said he got this small site and I went to have a look at it and gave us a map and I couldn't find the site at all. There was no, well, where the hell is this site? And it turns out to be that I was actually standing on it. It was a part of the pavement. The site was so tiny, it was only uh, 2.4 metres at one end, 11 metres long and 600 millimetres at the other end. The only big value is that it is a very, very visible building on a crossing and therefore has lots of potential for being a landmark. The building's exterior is coated with a bamboo design that provides both shade and a view inside. We can explain to potential tenants that you can peel this off, it's just a sticky back film, and we will design you a new billboard or facade. Since the building's entire facade can be transformed into a billboard, the architects dubbed their creation the Billboard Building. It's about 2.4 metres um, at this end, and then it runs along a straight line. And then at the last minute, there's almost a diagonal cut, and it runs off to 600 millimetres here. So that's only 600. On this tiny plot, Klein Dytham Architects erected a two-story inhabitable billboard. The structure has a curved steel bow that gives way to a huge glass front. Since it consists of a series of two-story prefabricated units, workers were able to erect it in a matter of hours. Shortly after the microstructure was in place, it attracted a tenant. As I stood in front of this property for the first time, I never imagined I'd see my favorite color green painted on the walls. I got goosebumps. That's how fateful it was. And the reason I decided to have my own shop is because this property was available. But not all development in the city is this elegant or intentional. To an outsider, Tokyo can look maddening. A hodgepodge of old, new, ugly, beautiful, commercial, and residential, all crammed into the same area. The city's space crunch has spawned a myriad of multi-purpose structures, also known as hybrids. It wouldn't be going too far to say that almost every building in the center of Japanese large cities is a hybrid of some sort. You rarely find buildings that have a single purpose. Tokyo's more unusual hybrids include this driving school atop a department store and this building in Tokyo's Akihabara district. It consists of a shopping, restaurant, office area huddled beneath a railway viaduct. And this ordinary looking stretch of road is anything but. It appears to be a typical tunnel underpass for a roadway, but on top of it is a cemetery. It may be chance, it may be by intention, by design, but whatever the reason, it results in a very unique urban space. When architect Yoshiharu Tsukamoto surveys Tokyo's urban landscape, he takes notice of another special class of structures others overlook. You'll see these dwarfish afterthoughts shoehorned into slivers of space between or next to larger buildings. Tsukamoto has dubbed this type of petite design pet architecture. Pet architecture is a building which is a little bit uh, bigger than dog house, but uh, smaller than rabbit house, which is a pejorative name of a Japanese house given from a French cultural minister. They are built on leftover site in the city, and uh, it's very unique because uh, they have a strange shape like triangle or trapezoidal. Pet buildings, the smallest freestanding structures in Tokyo, are inexpensive casually constructed and functional. These structures simply refuse to let space, no matter how small, go to waste. It's something uh, shabby things. Huh? It's not a uh, gorgeous thing. It's not uh, a high cultural uh, product. Tsukamoto and his partner, Momoyo Kagima, became so fascinated with Tokyo's pet architecture that they published a comprehensive guide to the buildings in 2002. 
He took us on a tour of some of his favorites. Ah, so, 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 so. And look, beautiful, lovely. Stop number one is this barely visible building to the left of the staircase, a structure just larger than the doorway leading inside. In fact, the building spans just four feet across and 33 feet in depth. It's a real estate office of a small company. And uh, it's beautiful because uh, since uh, Japanese can be written from top to down, so we can make a vertical billboard. It is attaching to the next building, in fact. And uh, it's following the external staircase of the next building. So it's really interesting behavior. It's like small animals who found a place in the rock of the coast. Yes. Stop number two is this tiny red building, wedged at the base of these two high-rises. This tiny triangular shop sells rubber stamps and measures just 117 square feet. The ground floor is also covered by many information about uh, stamps and uh, how much cost, uh, etc., etc. I think uh, the, the design is really too much graphic oriented. Though hardly a triumph of aesthetics, this dwarf among giants inspires because it seems to exist against almost impossible odds. But there's a new form of development that is testing these same long odds. This may look like a parking lot, but it is actually the platform for a new urban space. For entrepreneur Masao Masumura, blacktop and parking spots represent an untapped source of real estate in a city that has little new space to offer. His company, Phil Park, built this prefabricated store in the airspace above the parking lot that he rented from the lot owner. The parking company use the ground as a parking lot, and we use the uh, air airspace. Um, we develop the structure and lease to the client. This is a fill park system. The footprint of the building consists primarily of these posts, each of which takes up less than one square foot in area. So the structure does not infringe on the parking business below. It takes just two weeks to build the entire structure from prefab modules. The building may stand for years before it's dismantled and moved to a new site. So we need to move this structure to the next site if landowner would like to terminate this contract. Buildings in Tokyo like these prove that less can truly be more. Small is beautiful, I think. <laughs> no, it's true. I think to be intimate with spaces, they can be a lot more interesting than vast houses. Small living spaces also enable more and more people to live and work comfortably in an urban nucleus rather than commuting from the suburbs. And it is these Tokyo neighborhoods that enhance the experience of compact living by drawing people out of their dwellings and into this city that redefines convenience. When you think something you want to do, you don't have to go back to a particular place like home. You can find a place to fulfill that desire in Tokyo so easily. There is a sense of unparalleled immediacy in Tokyo, of goods and services at your fingertips at all hours of the day and night. And the city will help you to make your wish happen as fast as possible and as much as possible. And Tokyo is maybe the closest model to such a dream world. In Tokyo, small can be beautiful and stylish, an opportunity for self-expression. It can at times also mean cluttered and cramped. But at its best, living small, both inside and outside the home, can bring us closer together.